Okay, uh, welcome everyone. If you are here, you are listening slash watching a um, Baltimore City Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals Zoning Appeals Docket. Today is February 22nd, 2022. It's a fun day, right? It's forward, backward, and upside down. I think that you could read this or write this. Manise pointed that out to me, the whole upside down thing. I was like, you know, you're 100% right. All right. So before turning it over to the chair, just going to go through a few WebEx rules. And just to give you guys the lay of the land, my name is Katie Byrne. I'm the acting executive director here at the BMZA. So essentially what I am is your host. I don't make decisions for the board. I help manage the WebEx hearing. I help um, guide the board if they have any questions, direct them to the right information. Um, the board members that you see before you, James Fields is our chair on the screen. We've got Bill Cunningham, who is also a board member, Sabrina Turner, who is also a board member, Otis Freeman, who is also a board member, and Leland Shelton, who is a board member. So those are the five board members. The other faces you may see would be Martin French, who is the representative from planning, Becky Witt, who is the board's attorney here at the BMZA, and Madison Russell, who is an intern here helping us at the BMZA. So those are all the people who are here presented in front of you as panelists. So if you've signed on via the internet, you're considered an attendee. And right now you don't have the ability to mute or unmute yourself. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a microphone, camera buttons, chat feature, um, some other buttons down there. You should be able to see the board myself on the screen. When your case is called, I will make you a panelist and unmute you. If your camera is functional, you should be able to turn your camera on and we will all be able to see you. If you are calling in, so we have people who can call in who don't necessarily have to use the internet. Um, what I'll do is I go through the list of call in users. When you are unmuted, you will hear two beeps. If you, if the case that has been called and you wish to speak on it, please speak up right away. If I do not hear anyone, I will move on to the next caller. If you're unable to connect to audio, please use the chat feature. If a speaker is um, inaudible, they'll be directed to call back or we'll try to work with you through the chat feature. There are two ways you can testify in support of any opposition. You can raise your hand when the case is called that you wish to testify on, or you can put in the chat a message identifying the case number and whether you support or oppose. Please do not use the Q&A. I can only have one open at one time but it will be a, um, it's going to be the chat, not the Q&A. So please don't put anything in the Q&A. The order of testimony is as follows. The applicant goes first, followed by any support for the application, then opposition, and then the applicant gets the last word and testimony closes. Please note anyone speaking on any matter before this board is deemed to be testifying under oath and required to speak the whole truth and nothing but the truth. If you have any issues with WebEx, you can call our office and someone should be able to answer your call. Do not call or email me directly because I will not see anything during the hearing. Our phone number is 410-396-4301. If you're having any technical difficulties and can't participate for any reason, please email us at bmza at baltimorecity.gov immediately um, if it impacts the matter before the board. All right, and at this point, I'll turn it over to Mr. Fields, our chair. Very well, thank you, uh, Ms. Byrne. Uh, after hearing your case, we will endeavor to uh, render decision during deliberation period uh, at the conclusion of the docket, um, unless for some reason uh, we find that we need additional information uh, or additional submissions, uh, at which time we'll let you know that, and um, uh, that would be a little longer in any event. You should be receiving your decision uh, in the mail within 30 days uh, of uh, today's hearing. Uh, if you would like a heads up and you weren't able to hear the deliberations, you can give the BMZA office a call at 410-396-4301, and they can give you a, a, an understanding of uh, what took place with regard to your matter. Uh, but we do ask that you not uh, commence your project until you receive your a formal decision uh, from the board and certainly uh, don't do any work within Baltimore City without pulling the proper permits. Uh, we do have um, a few matters on the docket uh, that have been postponed or withdrawn. So I want to let you know what those matters are. 
So if you're here or you've signed on uh, to participate in those matters, uh, either they'll be reset or you'll get additional information in the future about um, when that will be heard. Uh, the first case we have is postponed is case number 2021-312-912 Newington Avenue. The appellant there is Havila Investments LLC. Again, the address 912 Newington Avenue, that matters postponed. Uh, the second case being postponed is case number 2021-322, 617 South Eaton Street. Adam Carballo is the appellant. Again, 617 South Eaton Street will not go forward. Uh, and we have uh, case number 2021-330, 2904 Riggs Avenue. Uh, Demilola Akinagbi is the appellant. Again, 2904 Riggs Avenue, that matter is postponed. And the other matter that has been withdrawn, uh, that is case number 2021-329, 807 North Calvert Street. Uh, the appellants are Adrian and Jennifer Goldschmidt. That matter has been withdrawn. Right. Uh, our docket is uh, divided into two sections. One would be the consent docket and secondly, uh, the contested docket. The consent docket are those matters for which the board believes it has sufficient information to approve the appeal uh, based on its submissions, based on our review of the applicable code provisions um, and our ability to uh, grant the relief requested. Uh, so we'll run through the consent docket uh, first, and I'll do that by calling the case number, hearing reports that we may have from staff and planning, and then uh, resolve the matter uh, by talking with the uh, the appellant or the appellant's uh, representative. Uh, and thereafter, we'll, we'll address the uh, contested matters and we'll do that in a similar fashion. All right, so I'll commence with the uh, consent matters. First case on the consent docket today is case number 2021-323, 1723 East Lombard Street. The appellant is Carbala Architecture. And this appeal involves an interior renovation to the basement and ground floor to use as a grocery and, and carry out deli. And I'll hear from uh, any reports we have from planning and staff. Thank you, Martin French for the Baltimore City Department of Planning. Planning Department has reviewed this application. Notes that this application basically covers two different types of uses. The carry out food shop is not listed as a permitted or conditional use in the R8 zoning district where this property is located. And therefore, the department believes that the carry out deli is not approvable. However, the balance of the application is for a neighborhood commercial establishment, and this property does meet the criteria necessary for approval of that use. The department therefore recommends approval of the portion of the application relating to the grocery store, which is a type of neighborhood commercial establishment for which this property is qualified. The department recommends disapproval of the portion of this application relating to a carry out food shop because a carry out food shop would be a non-conforming use in the R8 zoning district. And the zoning code prohibits approval of a new non-conforming use. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, as Mr. French stated, this is to use the basement and first floor of, the, of as a grocery and carry out deli in an R8 zoning district. As Mr. French stated, a carry out deli, the board does not have jurisdiction to approve that. However, the board still can approve a grocery on the first floor as a neighborhood commercial retail goods. The his land use history on this land use cards show significant history of commercial uses on the ground floor, grocery store, video store, rental, uh, secondhand store, confectionery, furniture store. So it has been used as a commercial space on the first floor of this property for many, many years. Um, the as advertised, it can be a grocery. However, the board does not have jurisdiction to authorize a deli. So just Mr. Carvalho, just want to make sure you under understood that piece of it. Uh I, I do. We um, met with the community, um, or uh, the Upper Fells Point um, Development Impact Association, I believe it was called, um, and we spoke about this. Um, <clears throat> what my client would like to do is actually provide the grocery, but also have prepared foods that would be, you know, able to be removed or you know, you know, eaten off premises. Um, I understand that, like anything with respect to carry out would have to go to city council um, if it were to, uh, if they were actually to be able to uh, use that use in addition to the grocery. 
Uh, the board can't approve uh, a carryout. It can only approve a grocery. But if you go into a grocery store, a lot of grocery stores prepare food, like, and it it seems like there's a certain like amount of gray somewhere area. else, right? But we cannot call it a carryout. Mr. Okay. Frank, we can call it a grocery. Yeah, is it? Yeah, it, it seems. I mean, in terms of you know prepared foods like. I don't know, salads, sandwiches, things that are pre prepared and packaged uh, simply for purchase uh, 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 to take not, you know, coming in and ordering a pizza and you wait for the pizza to be made and or a sub uh, to be made and, and go. Um, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ms. Byrne or even uh, Martin, if, if, you know, I don't know that there are restrictions on a grocery and having prepared foods um, so that uh, I think that's all encompassed in uh, a grocery. Uh, so that's what I'm hearing. I mean, you know, you're, you're suggesting uh, prepared foods and any grocery store I go into, I think has a significant modicum of uh, a little or a lot of prepared foods uh, uh, to take out. Well, by very nature, a grocery store is for off-site consumption. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If I go and buy, uh, <laughs> you know, a head, a head of lettuce, I'm not eating it there. I'm not taking it with me to eat somewhere else. Um, so, yeah, my, my client wants to provide a, you know, healthy food alternative rather than sugary drinks and candy bars that you would find, like, in a corner shop. They want to be able to provide effectively a grocery store with prepared foods, fresh squeezed juices, things like that. Um, nothing to do with alcohol, tobacco, or anything like that. It's basically a healthy food alternative, uh, but with prepared foods as part of the grocery concept. Um, it's maybe just a matter of how you classify it, but it's effectively a grocery store. Great. And so we're we're clear that the the applicant is not seeking, uh, is not filing a request for a carryout. It's simply a grocery store. Correct. Everything wants to do. Okay, um, Mr. French, is there anything you want to add to that discussion that we had, or I think it's really clear. Not a great deal. I remember in past uh, years the board tried to divide carryout food shops from grocery stores <laughs> over the very issue that Mr. Cabal was raising. Mm -hmm. And I think in the end, they decided if you had a fat fryer and you were cooking French fries, or if you had a pizza oven, you were making slices of pizza to go, that was a carryout. But other than that, I'm not sure they could come up with much. And certainly I acknowledge that, yes, a lot of grocery stores have uh, food ready made to go, uh, mm -hmm. in addition to food you're going to take home and cook yourself. So uh, we have no problem. Just delete the words carryout from this uh, appeal, and uh, it would be fine with us. Okay, good. Fair, fair enough. I don't think there's okay. any objection to that. All right. Great. Uh, given that um, and that understanding, Mr. Caballo, of uh, the, the board having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> James, before we get to the next appeal, I've had a message in the chat about concerns for, I think it is the next one, which is 1701. Yeah, right. right. So I think probably best to move that to the end of the to the regular yeah. pocket okay I'm 325 1701 north Elmont to the regular docket okay uh, moving on the next case on the consent docket is case number 2021-328 1123 south elwood uh, jennifer hartman is the appellant in this matter addresses uh, a variance to bulk regulations related to the construction of a deck at the third floor rear and rooftop deck. Now, here are the reports we have from planning and staff. Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Okay. Two variances are requested for the construction of a third floor deck and rooftop deck. The rear yard setback, 20 feet is required by code, zero feet is proposed, so it's a requesting a variance of the full 20 feet. Rear yard setback, that's the rear deck. The rear yard setback for the rooftop deck, 
20 feet is required, seven is proposed. So it's a 13 foot variance for the rooftop deck. The existing row house extends to the rear lot line for the first and second floors. The third floor deck would rest atop the existing second floor and would provide access to the proposed rooftop deck. So the rooftop deck is within the 35 foot minimum height restriction as well. And will be subject to design review by planning. So just so everybody has that visual, right? That third floor deck is gonna be on top of an existing second floor. Okay, and Jennifer Hartman is the applicant. Let me find Ms. Hartman. All right, if you are here as the applicant for 1123 South Ellawood, either please raise your hand or put it in the chat. Well, I don't, do not see Jennifer here. I will start to go through the call in users. All right, and Becky, if you could help keep me um, see if you see anybody raise their hands. So we're going through the call in users. If you are here for 21 328 1123 South Ellawood, please speak up. Moving to the next caller. Moving to the next caller. This is Philip Hartman. Oh, yes, Mr. Hartman. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, so, so yes, you, uh, are you on deck for the uh, for the appellant, Mr. Hartman? Yeah. Okay, very well. Um, sir, is there anything else you'd like to add to your application at this time? N not really. I mean, basically, the 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 deck off to the back is for access to the upper deck. So we have a basically a short um, a short roof on the back of the house uh the the plans that we submitted should show that and um, we're just asking for variants to be able to to do these construction the way our um our architect has presented okay well very well uh, the board having heard your appeal we believe you have sufficient information to approve your appeal thank you so much okay thank you thank you Uh, moving on the consent docket case number 2021-331 3801 hickory avenue garrett adler is the appellant and uh, this matter addresses variance to bulk regulations related to the construction of a two-story rear and side addition now hearing reports from planning and staff planning department has no comment on this application thank you thank you the project, let's see, uh, it's again, two-story rear addition, side addition. The only variance needed is a, it's a corner side yard variance. 20 feet is required, three feet is proposed. So it's a 17 foot variance requested from the corner side yard setback. Mr. Adler is here. I'm making him a panelist. Uh, Mr. Adler, I've unmuted you, sir. Oh, hi, can you hear me? Sure can, Mr. Adler. Uh, sir, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? Uh, if we're on the consent docket, then uh, I'm happy to uh, withhold my comments and I appreciate your consideration. All right, very well. Uh, the board having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thanks so much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good day. All right, moving on. Case number 2021-334, 4900 Boston Street. Uh, the appellant is Canton Development LLC, care of Caroline Hecker, Esquire. And this is a request to redevelop the property as a Popeye's restaurant with drive through facility and the variance requires for off street parking. Now, here any reports from planning and staff? Planning department has no comment on this application at this time. Thank you. Thank you. So the project is to use the premises as a restaurant with a drive through in an IMU2 zoning district. There are both variances and conditional uses requested. First one, off street parking, maximum of 10 spaces provided, two spaces allowed, an eight space variance is requested. Let me get Caroline 
Hecker here as a panelist. I want to make sure I'm doing, I'm saying this correctly. So Ms. Ms. Hecker, you've been made a panelist. So again, there's a maximum number of um, off-street parking. 10 spaces are provided. Um, two space minimum is uh, above the maximum is allowed. They're asking for an eight space variance. So it's an up, not a down. Okay. All right. Makes sense. All right. Thanks. Okay. So we've got, um, so is it a total of 20 spaces then? I think if I'm doing the math right. Yeah. That's I think right. Yeah. It's 20 spaces. All right. So it's, there we go. Stack spaces, maximum of six spaces are permitted. Nine spaces are proposed. So they're asking to add an additional three spaces. So again, it's an up thing. Um, there is a request for a conditional use for the drive through for this particular restaurant. So that's the conditional use piece of it. The industrial floor, floor space variance. In an IMU2 district, an industrial use must equal at least 50% of the floor area of the building on the lot unless granted a variance. And this is pursuant to section 11-203C2. So they're asking to use for not an industrial use of more than 50% of the floor area. So we have three variances and one conditional use. Anybody need me to repeat those again? So we've got two up parking, right? So we're going from a maximum of 10 now we're asking for 20, so it's a 10 additional parking spaces. And then for stack spaces, um, three more. Okay. okay. And Caroline, did I, am I missing any of them? Anything else? I'm pulling up the, the plan while you're speaking, I apologize. The parking, just, just to be clear, the zoning code does require a variance if you're providing more than twice the required number of spaces. We would only be required to provide space for 1,000 square feet of indoor public seating area. The building's only about 2,000 square feet, so we would only be required to provide two parking spaces. We're providing about 10 parking spaces on site, so it's an okay. increase more than twice the number of required spaces. And it's the All same right. thing for stacking spaces. You're allowed to provide three stacking spaces. We're providing more than six, more than twice, so we need a, a variance for that. Okay, so I, I I did the math wrong. So you're doing 10 spaces for off-street parking and nine spaces for stack. Either way, it's above, it's a maximum, it's a variance to the maximum number of spaces allowed. So you're providing more parking than not. Okay, exactly. thank you. Great. Okay, Ms. Hecker, is there anything in addition to that uh, clarification that uh, you'd like to add to your application? No, we submitted a, um, a PowerPoint presentation with some, some exhibits for the board's file, but unless you have questions, I have nothing further to add. Very well. Now the board having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to confirm your appeal. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, James and Car I have a question. What is a stacking space? Just out of curiosity. This is Sabrina. They're the spaces where the drive-through is, um, where you sort of stack up in a line, waiting to order and then pick up your food. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Calling case number twenty twenty one three thirty six. 526 Oldham Street. Patricia Howard is the appellant. And this is a request to use the ground floor as a yoga studio. And I'll hear any reports from planning and staff. Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This is a neighborhood commercial use to use the ground floor as a art studio slash yoga in an R8 zoning district. Uh, land use card uh, in history on this property in 1963, it was a dry cleaner in 1997, a grocery store and in 2002, a floor shop. So there is a long history of commercial uses at the first floor of this particular property. And I will find Miss Howard. Hmm. There she is. And okay, so Miss Howard, I'm gonna unmute you. I don't think I can make you a panelist. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. All right, all right, so Miss Howard, and welcome. Um, Thank is, there you. Anything, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? Um, other than I'm excited to be an asset to the community, bringing health and fitness. Um, this is a new area for me. I've been um, opened my first studio in two. 2006 
And um, that's it if you don't have any questions from me. No, oh, we're good. But I'm happy to tell you that the board having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, moving on to case number 2021-337, 1733 Covington Street. Matt Nofel is the appellant, and this matter addresses variance to bulk regulations related to the construction of a two-story rear addition and rooftop deck. And I'll hear any reports from planning and staff. Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. This is to construct a two-story rear addition rooftop deck. The variances are to lot coverage and rear yard setback. Lot coverage, 60% is allowed, 87% is proposed. So it's a 27% variance to lot coverage. The rear yard setback, 20 feet is required, 10 feet is proposed. So there is a 10 foot variance requested. And let me find Mr. Nofel. Uh, Mr. Nofel, I've just made you a panelist, sir. And you are unmuted. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? Uh, no, there's not. Very well. Uh, the board, having heard your appeal, I believe you have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thanks so much. Thank you. Ready. Uh, moving on, case number 2021-338, 207 Key Highway. Thomas Hunt is the appellant. And this is a request to use the premises suite A for a tattoo establishment uh, by private private appointment. I'll hear from uh, planning and staff for any reports you may have. Thank you. Planning department reviewed this application, noted that this property is located within the Federal Hill Historic District, and therefore any alterations to the building will be subject to approval by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Department recommends approval of this application be subject to the condition that all exterior changes, including any additions, demolitions, alterations, and signage are completed or installed in accordance with an authorization to proceed issued by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Thank you. Thank you. And it's to use Suite A at 207 Key Highway for a body art establishment in a C1 zoning district. It's a conditional use in order to have a body art establishment. Um, the parking plan has not been approved. Appellant must provide one space per 1,000 square feet of gross floor area. So there's no parking request uh, variance before the board, only the conditional use. But we just want to alert the applicant to the parking requirement. And Mr. Hunt is here. And I will make him a panelist. And Mr. Hunt, you're unmuted, sir. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Hunt. Um, sir, oh, yeah. I'm doing well, thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? No, not at all. Um, I don't know about the parking thing. It's a uh, metered parking out front. The whole strip is city metered. I don't know. I didn't know. We got a request of variance. Parking variance. Okay. Other than that, yeah, I don't know. But I'm just, you know, excited. Awesome. Uh, so we are we we're clear on the variances that are being requested, Katie. Yes. So the only sir, the only thing in front of the board right now is mm -hmm. your conditional use. So okay. if you do need to provide parking, so you'll go through Martin, chime in here if I'm wrong. Okay. Um, you'll go through a process for so if you do need to provide parking for you're in c1 um then you might have to come back for a parking variance but okay. um it's what it's you would need one per every thousand square feet well it's only it's nine, 900 it's, un, it's like 958 square feet right. my unit. then martin do you know if they need a one space variance or would they need a no space uh, variance? first comment is going to be there may be under the threshold. Second okay. thing is C1, to my knowledge at the moment, is still exempt from off street parking requirements. Okay. I know that zoning code is subject to amendment soon, and that may be something that gets changed. But at okay. the present okay. time, I do not believe they have an obligation to provide off street parking for this establishment. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Very well. All right, uh, gentlemen, I can happily tell you that the board, having heard your appeal, believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. 
I appreciate that. Thank All you, guys. Right. All right. Good luck to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. Take care. Okay. We go on to the next consent matter, case number 2021-339, 1509 through 1513 East Baltimore Street. Chanel Thomas is the appellant. This is a request to use the portion known as Suite B as a clothing design studio, sewing instruction, and retail store. And I'll hear any reports we have from planning and staff. Thank you. Planning department has reviewed this application, noted that this property is in the Washington Hill Historic District. And just like the appeal you just heard, it's subject to the similar rule concerning any exterior changes to the property. The department believes the use itself is approvable. The department recommends approval of the application, subject to the condition that all exterior alterations and signage are completed or installed in accordance with an authorization to proceed issued by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And very similar suite B art studio retail goods store in an R8 zoning district. It's a conditional use neighborhood commercial art studio and retail goods. Research shows for the zoning card several historical non residential uses 1953 garage and furniture paint shop, 1958 auto storage, 1960 auto repair and sales. 1960 office and garage, 1961 auto repair and sales. Other recent land use history include 2021 a barbershop, 2016 church outreach and classroom space. Yes, um, Ms. Thomas. So Ms. Thomas, I'm making you a panelist and you are unmuted. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Thomas, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time? There is not. All right, very well. Uh, well. The board having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. All right, good luck to you, ma'am. Okay. And the final case on the consent docket, case number 2021-344, 1517 Eastern Avenue, Nate Preddle is the appellant. And this is a request to construct a new five story mixed use building. Now, here are reports from planning and staff. Thank you. Planning department is not making a specific recommendation on this application, but does note that this property is in the Fells Point Historic District. And therefore, should the board choose to approve this application, it should be subject to the condition that all construction improvements and signage are completed or installed in accordance with an authorization to proceed issued by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Thank you. Sure. Uh, as was stated, construction of a new five story mixed use building in a C1 district. There is a rear yard setback of 20 feet required by code. Zero feet is proposed. So the rear yard setback would require a 20 foot variance. And I've made Mr. Prettle a, I think I did, a panelist. Yes. And he is unmuted. Hi, good afternoon, Ms. Byrne, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'll be brief on this. And this is a really exciting project and uh, the Chase and Companies has worked for about the last year and a half with several community associations. And also, as Mr. French noted, we've gone through the full chat process, had about four separate chat hearings, you know, at a concept level. The project was revised several times actually to reduce the height and scale in the required 20 foot rear yard setback. And, and I just would like to thank in particular the Douglas District Association. It must have been about a dozen meetings over the past year and a half, you know, many of them in you know, the residents' homes. So we thank them for that. And this is, uh, we're really looking forward to you know, uh, the board approving this and getting a building permit and you know, continuing to improve the greater Fells Point area. Uh, terrific. Well, thank you for that uh, background information, Mr. Preto. Uh, I can tell you that the board having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Great, thank you. Right. Okay. Now, it looks like that concludes the consent docket. Turn our attention to the regular docket. Um, and we'll start with this first case, 2021-215. Uh, Katie, I'm going to go ahead and call the case, but again, this is a matter for which I'm going to uh, recuse myself. Uh, and we'll just call it case number 2021-215, 1517 
3317 through 3323 West Belvedere Avenue. Uh, the appellant is Park West Medical Center, Inc. And uh, this matter seeks to consolidate 3317, I guess 3321 and 3323 West, West Belvedere Avenue and to construct an addition to the existing building at 3317 West Belvedere Avenue and a variance is sought for or required for all street parking. And I'll hear any reports from planning and staff. Thank you. The planning department has no comment on this application at this time. Thank you, sir. So this is, um, so we're, we're at, I just wanna make sure I'm looking at the right one. So Belvedere Avenue, right? 3317-3323 West Belvedere, okay. Again, project to construct an addition to an existing building at 3317 West Belvedere to continue to use as a mental health substance abuse behavioral health counseling in an R6 zone variances requested off street parking up to 49 spaces, zero are proposed. So up to a 49 space variance requested. Approximately 46 spaces calculated based on square footage of the addition plus an additional three spaces that may be lost because of renovation. So they're asking, go ahead and ask him for the maximum. Um, and then um, property history here, 3323 West Belvedere. Um, so it was condemned and demolished single family dwelling in 2013. Um, it was purchased in 2017 and Herbert Holdings, um, let's see, like issue was taxing certificate 2017 for close right of redemption 2019. Herbert Holdings learned of the demolition lien of 40,000 which exceeded the value of the vacant lot. They granted the property to Park West Medical on December 30th, 2021, and the deed is in the file. So I don't, I don't think it's hit land records yet. Um, potentially, I think they're about four months behind in recording deeds. That gives you a little bit of the property history. So we've got um, Ms. Hecker here, who is a panelist, and you are unmuted. Good afternoon, Caroline Hecker, Rosenberg, Martin Greenberg, on behalf of Park West Medical Center. Okay. Uh, if it's okay with you, I'd like to share my screen. I can walk through a PowerPoint presentation that I had sent over in PDF form, but I'll share it with the uh, the board if, if that's acceptable. Sure, I just passed you the ball. Perfect. All right, do you see the, the Front page of the slideshow from the PowerPoint. Is it up? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Um, all right. So this this is an application for a parking variance to permit the expansion of the existing Park West Medical Center. They're presently located at 3317 to 3319 West Belvedere Avenue. The property highlighted in yellow here. Uh, they're proposing to expand onto the two adjacent lots, lot four and lot five, which are 3321 and 3323. West Belvedere Avenue. Property is zoned OR1, uh, was recently rezoned from R6. All three lots are in the OR1 zoning district, uh, located in the sixth council district. Park West Medical Center has been in operation here since the early 70s. It provides valuable services to the Park West community. Um, and the expansion will allow them to streamline their services and provide even more efficient and better services to residents of the local area. Um, as I mentioned, the property was rezoned uh, from R6 to OR1 in the, uh, I guess, two, two uh, city council terms ago back in 2020. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's interesting. It looks like the property was originally established, like I said, in the early 70s under the R6 district. Um, the, the city zoning records are a little murky as to how that originally was established um, with a commercial zone in the residential district. but. In any event, by rezoning the property, we were able to, to clean that up and obtain appropriate permits for the facility. Um, this is the site plan showing the proposed expansion. Again, these are the, the existing buildings here. Oh, hang on a sec, how did I go too far? Um, the uh, proposed expansion will cover the entire adjacent lot and then a portion of the, the lot next to it. Um, the there was a building on this most of uh, the farthest structure or farthest lot over that has subsequently been demolished as uh, Ms. Fern indicated that property uh, was recently purchased by Park West Medical Center at tax sale. 
Um, it was demolished back in, I think, 2013, um, so the, the building has been gone for a while. There's no parking that's provided on site right now. So while we are asking for a parking variance, that is an existing condition and the proposed expansion is relatively modest compared to the size of the existing structure. There are parking lots um, located on adjacent properties that Park West has an agreement with where they share those parking spaces with the churches um, when, you know, they're during their uh, peak hours because they're, uh, they have different peak hours, obviously, than the churches. Um, in addition, there are a couple of parking spaces in the back that we may lose during, um, as a result of the construction, I think there's a transformer that's proposed to go back in that location. And um, as a result, we may lose uh, about three spaces back there at maximum. So um, we are requesting a variance to provide zero parking spaces on site. Uh, this goes through the, the math on the parking spaces. The healthcare clinic requires three spaces per thousand square feet. Um, so, you know, it is a, a relatively hefty parking requirement for a small addition to the existing facility. But um, again, the, the property does not provide um, any, any parking right now. Um, the floor area of the addition is 15,000 square feet. So, you know, we would be looking at 46 off street parking spaces being required just for the addition. And, um, and again, we, there's plenty of parking that's available on street and in the adjacent parking lots that Park West has um, an agreement with. We've done extensive community outreach on this over the last several years, um, and there should be letters of support in your file from uh, the Park Heights Renaissance Group, the Manor Bible Baptist Church, the Lord's Church, Hilltop 4100 Neighborhood Association, Neighbors United, JNNRL Neighborhood Association, Pimlico Good Neighbors, Northwest Baltimore Partnership, and the Park Heights Faith-Based Community Development Corporation. All of these letters should be in your file. I'll just click through them quickly here. Um, you know, we, the, the Park West facility really is um, a, a, an important fixture, an important institution in the neighborhood. And the expansion here is supported by all of the relevant community associations who will benefit by the improved facilities that will be available uh, upon the expansion. Um, I can go through the, the various variant standards um, if, if the board is interested. Um, you know, the, the issue here, the reason why the property is unique is that it is, it represents an existing facility that, um, an existing building that covers most of the existing property. The expansion area is very small um, and there just physically isn't any space on the property to provide the required number of parking spaces. Um, and but as a practical matter, again, there is plenty of available parking both on the street and on the adjacent parking lots. So um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that um, you may have. And I can. Uh, Ms. Ms. Hecker, can you go through? Um, sorry, James, I'm kind of jumping in here. Um, no, I know we, we, do have, we do have someone here who has their hand raised who wants to speak in opposition. Can you explain the ownership history for the board? Oh, certainly. Yeah, so um, let's see. The property was. Uh, I think. I think you're re you're referring to specifically 3323 uh, West Belvedere Avenue, which is the farthest Correct. over. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. Um, that property was condemned by the city in 2013 due to the uh, condition of the existing structure. Um, it was sold at tax sale in 2017, and another. Another company called Hobart Holdings bought the tax lien certificate at tax sale at that time. Um, they foreclosed the right of redemption in 2019, and uh, they then conveyed the property to Park West. Uh, there, there is a deed that I sent over to the board. You could have it in your file. Uh, Park West acquired the property at the end of 2021. The deed has been submitted to land records, but as you mentioned, land records is several months behind in actually getting uh, documents on record, but it will be recorded very shortly. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, this is Bill Cunningham. Um, mm -hmm. the, the facility has agreements for how many spaces uh, in area parking lots. Um, that is a good question. I don't know the exact number of spaces that they have. It's um, it, it, I, just judging from the, um, the size of the parking lots, it has to be in the neighborhood of at least, you know, somewhere in the 50 to 75 space range. Okay, thank you. Katie, you can go ahead and continue to run this one. Okay, um, so I think that if no one has any more questions for Ms. Hecker, what I thought I would do is share CodeMap so that you guys could see um, 
the lot that we're talking about. Oh, I have to take the ball back from you. Hold on. And it literally is a little circle. That's why I do refer to it as the ball. And it's probably there's a better technical name for it, but I just pass the ball back and forth. So if the board can see this. Yeah. This, this is what um, Ms. Hecker was referring to. This lot is owned by Park with Health Systems. This is the lot she's referring to that where the property was demolished. It did have a lien on it. Um, you can see it still doesn't show that it's been transferred yet, uh, which is why the deed was provided. So it's the lot. This is the lot she's talking about right here. And where are the parking spaces? Let's see if I can do an aerial view for you all. There's um, the properties on Denmore Avenue, I think 5101, 5103 is Denmore, and then also with the church in the parking lot. So here's Denmore, 5103, 5101. That's the parking area. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's existing. Right. They, they use that currently. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. All right, and then um, if there's no other testimony and support, um, we'll move to like, opposition testimony. I have one, one question. This is always for you. Yes, Ms. Heckler, as far as the, the amount of people going in and out of the building in, in any given day, do you have any information given that? Persons who are, are leaving and coming. Are you talking about the number of people, the number of uh, clients and patients that they see? Right. It's a good question. I, I actually don't know. Um, someone from Parkwest may be on the line though. I know we had a number of um, of folks who were going to participate. I see. Um, it looks like Patrice Wallace is present in the attendee list. She may be able to answer that question if I can. I'll make Miss Wallace a panelist. <laughs> In, in addition to Mr. Freeman's question, I'm looking at the uh, Google Maps view of the back of it, and there is a sign on the parking lot that says doctors parking only. Is that still the case, or is the parking lot in the back also for the people who've come to see the doctors and not just the doctors? There's a fence and a, a sign that says doctors parking only. Miss Wallace may be able to answer that question also. Okay, I'm, I'm Miss Wallace. I've made you. Uh, there you are. Your panelist. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. Yes, um, I, I can answer the questions. Uh, to address behind the the facility, yes, that is for employee parking. That was the agreement with the church that's immediately behind them. So they do use that for staff parking. As Ms. Hecker has already stated, across Denmore, you have the two lots and you also have street parking. As far as the traffic going in and out of Park West Health System, most of their residents are right along the bus line, right in front of the building is a bus stop and they utilize that or they're within walking distance from the facility. Park West is comprised of three locations, one at Quantico and Park Heights, the one at Belvedere is the main location and then one at Rice's Town Road Plaza. So it's not like they have enough traffic to justify um, congestion. I um, also have one question. Uh, how far is, is, is this location from the Metro stop? Uh, it's, a, it's the West Rogers stop is the closest. Yeah. Um, so the bus that runs down Belvedere is what would take you to that stop. And then you also, it's a block down from um, Park Heights and Belvedere where Pimlico is, is diagonal from Pimlico. So you have the bus stops there as well. Okay. And I like to add the agreement has been with the churches since 1992. <laughs> when they, they built um, the single level uh, 2002, which took the parking lot of the existing 3319 building. So they were granted, I, I believe, a variance then. 
I don't have any further questions. Are we are we good and ready to move then to any opposition? I am. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Wallace. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep you around, but I'm gonna mute you. Thank you. All right. So we have Carol Johnson. So Ms. Johnson, you're unmuted, ma'am. Yes. Hello. Yes. Um I'm just curious because my mother and grandmother own the property of 3323 and we've been paying the taxes and the water bill and we've never had a lien so i'm confused as to all the things that has been said so um miss johnson um i would direct you to miss hecker because she provided the board with a deed that shows that 3323 has indeed been transferred to the current owner who's applied for this variance and so when was that i have the original deed with my i'm i'm speaking on behalf of their estate because both of them have passed away one passed away in 2020 and one passed away two weeks ago which is why I'm now involved in this because I personally have been paying the taxes and water bill and I've never received any kind of lien, any information. I've left four messages with Ms. Hecker to give me a call before we even had this hearing so I, someone could explain to me what was going on. And the city of Baltimore told me I had to log into this meeting to get any information. Well, I, I get the hard thing for us is that the ownership of the property is not before the board. The use is before the board. If there is uh, something to contest to the ownership, if you believe that that was an issue, I can definitely help you talk to someone in the tax office. But Ms. Hecker represents the ownership and has provided a deed um, that's been submitted to land records to be recorded. It just hasn't shown up yet. Um, so, I'm I'm not quite sure. I have the deed to the house, well, to the land because there's no house there anymore. We've never received any kind of lien, and there's never been any issue with paying the taxes because they're they're cash they're taking my money that I'm paying them, and the water bill that's being paid every three months. So I'm confused. If the land was sold, why am I still paying the city of Baltimore? That's a very good question, ma'am. Um, and that that's something maybe I could try to help you with to get you somebody in the tax office. But what I was going to do really quickly for the board was pull up Maryland Case Judiciary and search to see the tax sale foreclosure and see if the, to the judgment or Caroline, do you have anything that, that you can share? Yeah. Are you speaking to me or something? I've been talking this whole time muted. I'm sorry. Um, so what what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the ball to Miss Hecker to see if she can share um, her screen with the board with the deed. If that can, do you have that available or would you? Okay. I do. And, and then also while she's doing that, um, I'm going to pull up Maryland Case Judiciary and look for the uh, tax sale foreclosure. And then um, Ms. Johnson, what I might be able to do is try to give you a contact in the tax office. Okay. If you're able to see my screen right now, this is the deed that was granted at the end of December of last year between Hobart Holdings, which bought the property, bought the tax sale certificate, um, and Park West Health Systems. And just keep sharing for a second, flip to something else. Um,
How was a tax sale conducted when there was no lien? There, so um, I, I, this is probably not the right forum to, to litigate the tax sale, but there, there was a lien put on the property when the building was demolished. Uh, the city did the demolition after finding that the building was unsafe and uninhabitable. Uh, they demolished the building. There was, I want to say the lien was something in the neighborhood of $40,000. Um, and then when that was not repaid, the city ultimately sent the property to tax sale where it was sold. We were um, never notified and the property ended up getting condemned because when we had that hurricane, the tree fell on top of it. That makes sense. Um, I, here, I can share, I, I was looking for the actual documents, but it's easier. I found an email that my, my partner, Dustin Williams, had put together. With, I don't know if this is going to come through large enough for you to see it, but um, there's a clip here from the proceeding in the circuit court in the case of Hobart Holdings LLC versus Caroline Pinkney et al., the defendants. Uh, this was the foreclosure of the right of redemption in the tax sale case. Um, and then this, and this occurred in 2019. And then the city uh, worked with Hobart to uh, request the removal of the demolition lien. This was approved by the Board of Estimates in June of, of 2021. Um, and the clip from that memo is on the screen here as well. Yeah, I, I can't. So, Ms. Johnson, you're basically telling the board that you still believe you own the property and this is your objection before the board. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so what I'm going to do, Ms. Johnson, is I'm going to um, see if I can get you some contact information for people in, um, in the city law department and in the city tax office to see what happened with the tax sale lien. I was able to verify that the building was demolished. I was able to verify that there was a $40,000 lien that was placed on the property for the work that was completed by the city. And um, as Ms. Hecker just showed that the case number does show up in city court records. Is there anything else you'd like to add, ma'am? So you telling me since 2000, but the last almost decade, the city of Baltimore has been collecting money from me for properties that they had a lien on that we was never notified of and still kept taking the money. I don't. If they I sold the property. If they sold the property, why were they still taking my money? Ma'am, I don't know that I, I can put you in contact, hopefully with someone that that can help you with that. Yeah, because I, I just got a water bill for that property. You got a water bill for a vacant property? Yes, yeah, I've been getting water bills for years for a vacant property. And and, and um, Ms. Johnson, just to clarify, who, who, the name of, what was what is the name of, name of your mother, the person who Wendy, you knew? It's Caroline Pinkley was my grandmother. Wendy James Mayhan was my mother. Okay, thanks. And when my grandmother passed away, everything reverted to my mother. And when my mother passed away, it reverted to me. However, I've been paying all of this for years. The taxes at first was $332 a year, and then it went down to $123. And the water bill varies. This month, I, it was $26. The month before that, it was $78. So it varies every time. And I've asked, why am I paying the water bill? They told me a length. They come and take the pipes from under the ground. I would still get a water bill. Miss Byrne, you'll be able to um, help Miss Johnson with this tax issue. I will. So I've just pulled the case numbers off. Um, I know. 
I know the backside out of it. I know how the liens are placed from housing. I also know um, some people in the tax office. So Ms. Johnson, what I'm gonna do is, um, are you able to see the chat? Can I, if I put my email address in the chat, can you email me directly? And then I'll put you in contact with people at the city to help you figure out what happened. Okay, so which, what's your email? All right, it is Kathleen, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N dot burn b y r n e at baltimore city all together dot gov is burn um even though we have this confusion about tax issues and such um it seems to me there's no reason we can't move forward with the um Zoning issue. Right. Okay. Variant. You can, you can deliberate. You've received um, information um, from Ms. Hecker about ownership and as well as use. Okay. All right. So shoot me an email, Ms. Johnson, and I'll put you in contact with the right people. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Great. Um, so, Ms. Johnson, I've just muted you, is, and I don't see any other hand raised, and I don't see anything else in the chat. So, I think that concludes the opposition testimony. Um, except for um, Ms. Wallace, your first name spelling. Oh, I have to unmute you. Sorry. Patrice, P is in Paul. A T R I C E. Thank you very much, ma'am. You're welcome. All right, back to you, James. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Hecker, I don't anticipate there's any rebuttal that you needed to add at this point. Very well. Uh, very good. That'll include matter 215. Uh, moving on, I'm going to move to case number 2021 227, 701 South Curley Street. Uh, hey, the uh, uh, go ahead. Sorry, just I want to remind you about 2021-225. Remember, we moved that one from the regular from the consent docket to the regular docket. That's just Sandy's Learning Center. All right. Well, Alma. yeah, we had that. We had that note up. Let me just go to that one then. Okay. Uh, let's. Uh, okay. Uh, let's call 2021-325-1701 North Alamont Street. The appellant is Sandy's Learning Center, and this is a request to use premises as an adult daycare center. And I'll hear any reports we have from planning and staff. All right, thank you. Planning department has reviewed this application. Planning department is recommending approval of the application, but notes that this is basically resuming an adult daycare use of the property that was previously authorized, uh, but has lapsed. However, the department does note with concern that there is a need to have proper garbage and trash removal to accommodate the resumption of this use. The department therefore recommends that approval of the application be subject to the conditions that the applicant provides safe and adequate drop off and pickup areas for adults as there is not one on the property currently and provide all street parking meeting zoning requirements for staff of the daycare facility as the application did not state the number of staff who would be on site at any given time. And finally, that they provide safe and sanitary storage and removal of garbage and trash from the property on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. French. Um, piggybacking on what Ms. French said, this is to use the premises as an adult daycare center in an R6 zone. Currently, there's an active vacant building notice on this property dated March 10th, 2019. So as in order to get the use and occupancy, um, if the board were to grant this conditional use, they would have to bring the property up to um, building code standards in order to use it as such. And this is Sandy's Learning Center. I do not see a Sandy here in our list. So I'm going to go through the call in users. If you are the applicant on, oh, looks like I've got somebody here. Um, Kevin Ellis, it looks like, is the applicant. So Mr. Ellis, I'm going to make you a panelist. And you are you are unmuted, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Ellis. Uh, go ahead and tell us about your project, sir. 
Uh, the project is to do an adult learning center. There's a lack of, uh, well, adult daycare center. There's lack in the area and the building isn't currently being used. We have a existing daycare facility, uh, adult daycare facility that wants to expand in this location. That's where we are. Okay. Well, can you tell us about, uh, if you are listening in or able to hear uh, Mr. French from planning, uh, there is a need uh, for this particular property for a safe drop off and pickup uh, area. Can you tell us about uh, what the plans have, uh, what plans you have for that? Sure, there is an existing parking lot behind the building. We did not submit a uh, parking plan with the application, but I can submit that. There's an existing lot behind the building that people can be dropped off and picked up from. Is is that lot attached to the property? Yes, yes it is. Okay. Uh, how, how do you access that lot? That lot has a driveway. Uh, it, it, you access it from, let me figure out the street. It's, it's just the side, it's the side of the building. Um, if I'm sure that you have the pictures, it has two sides of the building. The side that's not Elamont, there's a driveway right there that you can access that back parking lot. Okay, okay. so folks would park there, walk around? Uh, there's a door there as well. Um, so they could actually park there and walk straight through that door. There are three entrances on the ground floor. There's one on North Alabama, there's one on the side, and there's one uh, entrance from the parking lot. All of those entrances, well, the, the, all of those entrances are pretty close to the elevator and all of them uh, have stairs that could go upstairs if people wanted to go upstairs. I'll, I'll pull up the map if, if the board would like to see it. Yeah, I can't find it. Sure. Okay, sure, hold on uh, and I'll screen share. And while while we have you on that issue, sir, do you are you familiar with the uh, the number of proposed staff, and consequently the number of spaces needed? Um, I do not have those numbers at the moment. I'll be glad to provide them uh, to you later. Well, can you tell me how many spaces are available in the parking lot? In the sp in the parking lot right now, there are about twenty spaces in the parking lot. So is is this it, Mr. Ellis? Can that you see is it? it. Right there on Presbury Street, there's a little, I can't, you can't really see it, but there's a, there's an alleyway there and there's a little, yeah, right there. And you can in access this area. Also where that little red dot is to your left of your, right there, there's a door that accesses right into there. Ms. Burns, how many parking spaces do they need for staff? Actually, I don't think they need any parking. I thought Martin mentioned something about it. Martin, jump, you wanna jump in there? Okay, yeah, the requirement is one parking space for every four staff on peak shift. Well, and that's the reason that we need to explore how many staff would be on peak shift. Okay. I will have to get that information for you. I don't have it at the moment. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out if there'd be a conflict with staff parking and um, client drop off and pick up. Um, Mr. French, is there any, uh, assuming the uh, number of available spaces in the parking lot, are sufficient to accommodate staff. Is there any, do you acknowledge any prohibition or limitation on that space also being utilized for a drop off and pickup? Not so much a prohibition. I'd say the practical limitation, and I think this photograph probably illustrates the problem, and that is uh, vehicles would turn off the street up an alley into a parking lot and then have to circulate in that parking lot in some way back out come back down the alley and back to the street. It's not a very effective and efficient way to do it. And in certain cases, especially if an adult being dropped off was let's say using a wheelchair or some type of device like that, it might not be terribly practical. Uh, we are not convinced that there are in fact 20 off street parking spaces meeting zoning code standards on that paved lot. And they would need to provide a parking lot site plan showing uh, that the spaces meet the dimensions of the zoning code, which is nine feet by 18 feet, 
and that there's a sufficient drive aisle and uh, remind the applicant, of course, that tandem spaces don't count, only the spaces that are directly accessible from the alley or the public street, which leads us back to the whole issue about the circulation of traffic for drop-off and pickup. So there really needs to be a well thought out parking plan um, so that the staff can park and not obstruct drop-off and pickup. And that is something that this applicant needs to work on. Can you just and describe the problem, of course, is the board doesn't know how much variance to grant until the board knows how many parking spaces are supposed to be provided, which is based upon the staffing. All right, which is information that we don't have uh, today. Uh, sir, it, it's, it's, so what this is suggesting is that uh, there's additional information uh, that um, the applicant's going to need to provide in order uh, for the board to uh, render an appropriate determination. Because, uh, you know, these numbers certainly have meaning. Uh, and depending on the number of staff, you know, dictates the number of spaces you'll need. And uh, what Mr. French uh, just mentioned also about the ability to utilize that space in the back and what the requirements are for actual parking spaces. Uh, that certainly, you know, has meaning as well. Uh, this is your, I take it, this is the first time before us, correct, Ms. Byrne? Yes. Okay. Uh, because Mr. that information is... I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to say that I would guess, looking at the map, that the trash will be handled at that same parking lot. So that's another issue that has to be looked at. Fair point. Um, what we can suggest to you is perhaps to uh, take a postponement so that you can gather uh, information and support uh, for these very critical issues. You know of parking, uh, uh, and also it, while while we have you, uh, what's your understanding of the of the trash situation? Will it be handled in the back there? Uh, yes, that is my understanding. Okay, so there's another, uh, I guess, uh, concomitant use uh, for that space. Uh, it sounds to uh, to me and to the board like uh, we're going to need some additional information. Okay. Uh, if you can provide it. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll have to go on the information that we have. So uh, I, I, I would offer to you uh, with the board's consent, you know, for you to uh, have a postponement to give you the time to do that. And when you have that information, uh, to come back before the board and, and present it so we can resolve those issues. Okay. And um, who can we work with on our side so he's not flying blind on us? No. Martin, any thoughts? Uh, well, definitely first the community planner, which would be Chad Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S. Uh, and his email address is very simple, chad.hayes at baltimorecity.gov. Uh, mm -hmm. I would contact him first. You may also want to have um, a professional parking lot site plan drawn up showing the dimensions that I mentioned. Uh, also, of course, showing the pattern of circulation of traffic coming through. Obviously, you could do a loop through there using the alley, but you need to show that. Um, so somebody needs to draw up a dimension parking lot site plan, simply put. Uh, you can talk more with Chad about that. And uh, planning department would be happy to review that once it's prepared and you can send it off to us. Thank you. In, in addition, Mr. Ellis, I've just put in an email address for the president of the North Elmont Community Association, who is also on this call, who had concerns regarding trash, parking, um, all, the, all the issues raised by the board. So um, I'm putting her email and name and email address in chat directly to you for you to reach out to her as well. Thank you. Is that a public alley we're talking about? Yes. Is it, is it even legal to access an exit or parking lot off of public alley? Zoning code allows it. As okay, long as the alley is at least 10 feet wide. Thank you. So we'll have to confirm the dimensions of that alley as well, it sounds, uh, among other information. So uh, right. if the board concurs, uh, we can grant the postponement to the applicant. Yep. Okay. Uh, so yeah, and Mr. Ellis, when when you have everything together, please reach back out to the board, and we'll put you on the 
the or reach out to staff here and we'll put you on the next available um, docket. You will have to make sure that you're posted 21 days in advance, though. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. Good luck. Uh, Katie, should I go to uh, early at this point or uh, we're backwards to 324, Fremont? I'm not sure which might have. I think I think either one is um, fine. One is fine. Two hundred seven or Curly. All right, let's do Curly. Twenty twenty one dash two twenty seven seven zero one South Curly. Olivia Bahena is the appellant, and this is a request to use the second floor as a restaurant. Uh, I know that we had some history with this matter. Uh, we'll hear reports from planning and staff. Thank you. Planning department has reviewed this application, noted that this property is in the R8 zoning district. This particular property is currently authorized for use as a tavern, which is a non-conforming use in the R8 zoning district. And one of the provisions of the zoning code is to prohibit expansion of non-conforming uses. This particular building is a two-story building, end of row, and the applicant is proposing that the restaurant be up on the second floor level of the building in order to accomplish that without possibly creating an expansion of the non-conforming use on the first floor of the building it's necessary for the applicant to show how the access to the restaurant proposed would be completely separate from and, and uh, physically separated from the existing non-conforming use of the first floor the tavern uh, Separately, the department would like to note that if the restaurant obtains a liquor license, it needs to be a separate license from the tavern license, even though it may be held by the same person or party. Um, and if the restaurant does not obtain a liquor license, then patrons should not be allowed to purchase alcoholic beverages or alcohol in containers from the tavern downstairs as this would constitute a de facto expansion of the non-conforming use once they carry the beverages upstairs. Uh, they would basically be dining in an expanded tavern and the department believes that's not what the zoning board would contemplate. However, the property is eligible for neighborhood commercial establishment use and therefore the restaurant could be authorized on that basis. It's the physical layout that's going to be the critical thing here. The department also notes that the application proposed a carry out food shop as part of the application, the department recommends disapproval of the portion of the application pertaining to the carry out food shop because that would be a non conforming use in the R8 zoning district where the property is located. And the zoning code does not authorize creation of new non conforming uses. The department has no objection to approval of the portion of the application pertaining to a restaurant, provided that the restaurant use is separate from the existing non conforming tavern on the first floor of the premises, both physically and in, in liquor license terms. And that the restaurant otherwise meets all criteria for approval of a neighborhood commercial establishment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. And piggybacking on what Mr. French stated, conditional use to use the second floor of the premises as a restaurant and the continuation of the first floor use as a tavern. The tavern is a lawful non-conforming use in an R8 district. This would be a neighborhood commercial establishment restaurant. As Mr. French stated, a carryout is not permitted as a neighborhood commercial establishment, very similar to the conversation we had with Mr. Carbella at the very beginning of the docket, very similar here. Um, obviously you can sit down and get food, you know, at the restaurant and take it home with you, right? But it cannot be a true carryout. We have opposition letters from a neighbor, um, Mr. McBailing with proposed conditions request either the board deny the application or approve it with conditions relating to appropriate food waste disposal storage. Reason being rodents through to trash cans, riding food waste spills throughout Foster Street, attracting vermin. Um, also objecting carry out food stores lead to food delivery contractors, double parking, blocking pedestrian crossings and bike lanes um, suggested. Conditions for approval include dumpst a dumpster managed by a commercial waste disposal company with at least Excuse one collection, um, clean spills due to waste collection within three hours of um, 
in the spring and the summer within six hours in the winter and the fall. Food waste must be contained in sealed heavy duty trash bags. Duster must be, dumpster must be located away from the alley, away from pedestrians traveling on Foster. We have additional uh, signatures from neighbors, um, from three additional neighbors who are opposed to this use. I've made Mr. Kadinsky a panelist. He is representing the applicant. I believe he and the applicant are together here. Yes, uh, for the record, Melvin J. Kadinsky, 320 North Charles Street. I had the applicant here and um, we to make the record include we had submitted Petitions, I thought you had indicated you had them from uh, 64 people in the neighborhood who uh, were in favor of this um, use. Uh, they should be made part of the record. Uh, I'll let the record reflect that um, there are two separate uses. The tavern has nothing to do with the restaurant use. The restaurant use is a completely separate um, operation. You do not go through the uh, tavern uh, to go to the restaurant. Uh, there's outside uh, stairways to go up to the a restaurant. It's a small restaurant and only uh, would seat probably 20 people, three people working, probably a cook, waitress, and um, somebody to uh, work at the uh, cash register. Uh, the applicant is cognizant of the fact uh, of there was um, some letters. Most of the, if you read the letters, most of it had to do with another restaurant, not with, with this particular restaurant. The restaurant was on the other side. However, this particular um, Restaurant will have its own pickup, as the uh, same as the um, uh, tavern. They have a pickup uh, every other day. Uh, they have private pickup that picks up uh, the uh, trash. It's uh, underneath the steps there. Uh, they will also have the same company pick up their uh, trash. And if you look at the pictures that were submitted on their side, uh, that's their area is mostly uh, clean and um, uh, well kept. The discussion concerning the other restaurant, they're not connected with that other restaurant at all. Right. And just to clarify, Mr. Kodinsky, yes, the updated site plan that you provided um, is part of the record, as well as the petition of uh, the signatures in support is also part of the record. I neglect, did neglect to mention that at the outset. So that there's a, um, a big community outcry. Mainly it's a, a, a Latino, Mexican uh, type uh, menu. Uh, in that area, you have a big uh, Latino population that's moving into into that area. A lot of them like to come get some uh, uh, food it's from their countries or uh, Latino, and, and they'll be open basically from 10 in the morning till 10 at night. That's the basic hours uh, that they would um, uh, propose. Okay. Uh, what is the plan, uh, Mr. Kodinsky, for uh, a liquor license, if any, uh, with regard to the restaurant on the second floor? They can't get one. I mean, they don't have any plans for it, but they cannot get one. And it's not, and wouldn't be allowable under any circumstances. I think the maximum would be the one that's on the first floor. There's no way they could put a, a liquor license on the second floor. And they don't, number one, they do not um, ever play and apply for a liquor license. And they do not and will not allow people to take um, alcohol from uh, somewhere else or downstairs and bring it up to the restaurant. <laughs> Mr. Kaditsky, I'm looking at uh, two different, looks like two different trash areas. Um, is your client using the one with two city cans and a recycling can that's shown in a photograph? I don't see the photograph here. You know. oh. Is there any way you can show it to, to us? I can't. Oh, well, you know, Katie, oh, you got, you got mostly it's under the steps. They keep theirs under the steps there. Yeah, well, there's another photograph from what looks like under the steps, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, nine or ten cans. You, you sure it's not it's not the other restaurant. I don't know. That's what I'm asking. No, they don't have that many. Let me see if I can screen share the application. Yeah, they have the indicating to me they have two two green ones and one recycle. The other one that must be from that faux restaurant, I think. Okay. That, well, that was my question about the two cans on the recycling can. I was wondering what the other photograph was. Here, let me see if I can screen share and see if this is what you're looking at, Bill. Is this it? Yeah, that one. That's faux. That's the faux bar. Okay. So, and oh, that's, that, that's that's your client. It. Right. That's it. Right. Mm -hmm. I got you. Uh, this is Otis. I have a quick question. Um, as far as entering the restaurant area, 
I'm looking on Google Maps. Do you do you access that from the rear? Is that how you get to the restaurant? You, if you're looking at the picture right now, there's the steps right there. Are those, are those are the steps yep. right there? Mm -hmm. Okay. And is that also, the only way that you would? The Google, the Google Maps is from 2019. So it might not be exactly, at least the street view I'm looking at on Google Maps is from June of 2019. And I remember the last time we looked at this and she took us through with her phone. It did look a little different than it looks in the Google Maps picture. So just to confirm, Mr. Kadinsky, this is the entrance, correct? That's that's correct, and it's separate from the uh, tavern restaurant. And underneath that stairway, that there's an entrance into the tavern. There's also one from the uh, Curly Street. Curly Street is on the right of that photograph. It's all the way in the front. Okay, gotcha. You're on Foster Street side, more or less, and you see it's a pretty big sidewalk. Okay. All right, I see. The the yeah. yeah the, I was going to say the. Never mind. Sorry to keep asking, but so, so that that stairwell is the only way to access the restaurant. There's no other, um, I guess, way to go upstairs. Correct. Okay. There's no there's no inside and uh, entrance. I think that's what you're asking me. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Any other? Uh, so you, you mentioned uh, Mr. Gadensky, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Is that would that be seven days a week? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Any other questions for the board, for Mr. Gadensky? I'm good. Uh, is there anyone else who would be speaking on behalf of the applicant today? The the applicant is here with me, and I'm and I proffered what uh, she would say. I mean, if the board has any any question, but she's over here uh, with the the individual does the trash pickup uh, every other day. Okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, there's no requirement that she speak. Um, uh, we have, we've had your proffer. Uh, can we move to uh, any up? Do we have any opposition on the line, Katie? So I don't, no one has raised their hand yet uh, to speak in opposition, but what I'm going to do is going to go through the call in users. So I read to the board the, we had three letters in opposition and the uh, one from the neighbor, Mr. McBalin and his issues surrounding um, appropriate food waste uh, disposal and storage. Um, so that's definitely what we have. Um, let me see. So if anybody is here to testify in opposition, please raise your hand or put a note in the chat. In the meantime, I'll be going through the call in users. Katie, what letter did you just reference? It was a letter from Gary McFarlane. Oh, and they and they also had those photographs that I had referenced before. The photographs that you were referencing came in with the application, I believe, or or maybe not. Um, Becky, can you chime in on that? I... No, he sent he sent a bunch of them. Okay, then that, that was from Mr. McFarland. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it was from his, uh, there were attachments to his letters because he was, as Mr. Kadensky did point out, he was um, talking quite a bit about the issues that already exist with a um, existing restaurant that's kind of across the alley, I believe. Um, and so he was, he was showing photos of that other restaurant to kind of show what his concerns about this future restaurant would be. Okay, I see. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to go through the call in users now. If you are here to testify in opposition or support of 2021 227 701 South Curly Street, please speak up after you hear two beeps. Okay, moving to the next caller. Moving to the last caller. Okay, so we have no um, no one here in person. It looks like no one is raising their hands. Nothing in the chat. So no one here to, to necessarily speak in opposition. Other than what we have in the file. Okay. All right. Uh, well, if there's nothing else from us, well, there would be because uh -huh. there's no opposition. 
Uh, I'll just I'll just wrap up. I mean, I, I noticed, sure. and I don't want to place. I know Mr. Uh, McFarland's letter. If you read the letter, most of it has to do with the other restaurant. I understand his concern about you know trash and, and cans and blocking the alleys. And uh, my client is cognizant, and I think if you look at their side of the street, it's very clear and very clean, and they will agree to have a, a pickup every other day. The two people who had sent the letters in, they really didn't give a reason for their opposition, but it's certainly they're entitled to, to say what they want. And then you have the 64 people who live, if you look around and right all around this particular place that um, would uh, like to have this um, restaurant subject to being, you getting the health department, fire department, all the other approvals and appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, all right, that'll conclude 2021-227. Uh, uh, and then we'll go to case number 2021-324, 207 South Fremont Avenue. Adam Carballo is the appellant, and this is a request to use the premises as three dwelling units, and a variance is required for off-street parking. And I'll hear from planning and staff. All right, thank you. Planning department reviewed this application, noted that this property is located in the Ridgely's Delight Historic District. Therefore, any exterior alterations are subject to review and approval by Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. However, there is another issue with this property, and that is that it may currently be authorized for use as a single family dwelling, according to records available to this department in 2021, 2017, and 2011. It was listed as a single family dwelling on other applications for other purposes, such as construction permits. Therefore, the department believes that since the property is in an R8 zoning district, the multifamily dwelling use can only be authorized by ordinance according to the zoning code. The department is therefore recommending disapproval of the application because the zoning code does not authorize the board to approve conversion of a single family dwelling to a multifamily dwelling in the R8 zoning district where the property is located. Um, Mr. French, you still going or are you done? Complete. Okay. <laughs> I didn't I didn't I didn't want to didn't want to cut you off there. Uh so the request is to use the multifamily dwelling consisting of three dwelling units in an R8 zoning district. So we have off street parking. Um variance which is three spaces are required zero is proposed they need a three space variance request there is no uh request for lot area variance i think the lot i guess is is big enough there was no request for that so based on the history and the research that we found there's currently a vacant building notice on the property we have um the zoning history as a grocery store on the first floor two dwelling units above from 1957 to 1967 from 1957 to 1969. No additional use and occupancy permit was ever issued. So we have the last record of the use and occupancy as commercial on the first floor, two dwelling units above. Um, just to remind the board, under the old zoning code, it used to be that if you had a vacant building notice, it wiped out your last use and you had to start over under the new code and the new since 2017 that provision no longer exists so based on the research that we found the last use and occupancy um, for this property was 196 was established in 1957 as two dwelling units one commercial operation so if mr carbello is proposing a dwelling unit where the old grocery store or commercial space was, and then the two existing dwelling units that would mirror essentially the dwelling units that we have from the old land use card. Now, um, so, so staff here looked at it from last legally authorized issued use. So that's what we have. So that's, that still needs a ordinance for a third dwelling unit? It doesn't. Because you have an established multifamily, what you need is a variance for three parking units. Okay. And multifamily is defined as two or more. So, okay. and that third, it's interesting because the building code says that a multifamily is 
two unit, two residential units plus one other. So it could be a third residential or it could be a commercial use. The zoning code defines multifamily as two or more units. Did I just confuse you? Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. It'd be but nice if they said the same thing, but they don't. But what you're saying is we are not dealing with a single family that's seeking to convert to a multifamily. Right, and this is where our records and planning's records diverge a little bit. I think what Mr. French found were construction permits potentially or applications that were submitted where the applicant, I described it as a single family dwelling, mm -hmm. but based on use, issued use permits, we have to go back to the land use card and that was 1957. And there's been no, based on our research, additional use permits issued to change that. Unless the French has something I don't, I don't, that I wasn't able to find. Yeah, I was going to say, not to no, start, but Mark, what do you have the, better access to the records than we do? Okay. And the, and the issued use certainly governs, I mean, as I understand it, and we have those records now. Right. Uh, so that's helpful. Okay. Uh, all right. Mr. Cobala, <laughs> go ahead, sir. All right. Um, so, I guess just to clear up or sort of confirm a few things, um, as Ms. Byrne stated, um, you know, this property was in the 1950s and 1960s, was last used as two dwelling units above a grocer. Um, is, it a, is it okay if I share my screen? Sure. Let me pass you the ball here. Okay. And... I guess just to orient everybody, um, you know, we're at the corner of uh, Pratt and uh, MLK Boulevard, uh, Fremont, Fremont Avenue is this property here and which sort of sort of terminates. And this is actually our property here, number 207. Um, as you can see from the front of the property, um, there is a there's two doors. There is one uh, accessing a ground floor. Um, space and then a second door that had a, has a staircase that leads up to the upper floors. Um, you know, back in the 1950s, 1960s, um, our records show that it was a grocery store. Uh, we believe that after the 1960s, this was uh, in some way converted to a residential unit, uh, legally or illegally. Um, we see how there's a, a much later infill here where it removed the storefront. Uh, we also uh, have evidence of a uh, residential kitchen, residential restroom, you uh, know, bathroom, that kind of thing on this ground floor that would lead us to believe that um, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the ground floor is actually later a unit. Um, if I can bring up my Adobe. Um, you kind of see here on our presentation that again we're sort of highlighting uh, these areas and uh, we simply would like to you know continue using this as a three unit it has been vacant for quite a long time there's there's no question about that um, and but we do want to you know basically restore the building as per chap guidelines uh, we're not proposing any additions to this property uh, we do want to um, you know, provide a more period appropriate storefront to the to the front of the property, and then also replace the windows. Um, a few item, a, a few things worth mentioning. There is an existing stairwell, excuse me, fi uh, fire escape on the back of the building, um, leading to believe that it was a uh, multifamily at one point in time. Seeing these these photographs from the of the ground floor, you see remnants of a residential. Uh, kitchen, you know, kitchen cabinets. Uh, we also see a, a full, um, you know, full bathroom with a tub, um, something you would not expect to see in a grocery store. Um, and then in the in the basement of the cellar, there are three electric meters, three electric disconnects. Um, there's also three hookups for gas meters uh, in the basement or in the cellar area. Uh, the meters themselves are, are, are long gone, the electric, uh, the, the gas meters, but you can clearly see the three hookups um, that were, you know, 
suppose you know what were most likely used for for each one of the three units uh in the past um and another thing worth mentioning is that this property actually came before the board uh last year I'm not sure if you can see this uh petition um i, I switched files here um this was uh, a part of a hearing that occurred on january 26 of 2001 uh, excuse me excuse me 2021, um, uh, just about a, about a 13 months ago, and this was part of a uh, an appeal to consolidate 207 uh, South Fremont Avenue, the subject property, as well as two properties uh, facing Pratt Street. Um, these three collectively were uh, going to be part of a 35 dwelling unit, um, uh, you know, a project and the existing 207 property which was in an r8 zoning district uh there were they were uh, they were proposing to use that r8 uh, zoning property for eight dwelling units um we're simply asking for three uh this this address is not not part of this property uh, anymore, um, you can kind of use see here that this this um, up, uh, appeal was actually was granted um, under the conditions that the three properties would be consolidated, and then um, building permits were would be filed and uh, design sort of approved by the by the chat board. Um, you know, looking at our request now, we're um, these this property was never consolidated with the other two, uh, but we're not asking for eight units here we're asking for three which i think is more in keeping with what was at the property um you know from the sort of late 1960s early 70s onward until it, it became vacant um it, it's hard to estimate when the when the property became vacant but it, it has been vacant for quite some time uh but it was all you know part of um we believe three units based on the evidence that we're seeing on site as well as um, you know the the multiple meters and uh, separate entrances to the property, and uh, you know with the fire escape that uh, led for um, you know led second means of egress off the upper floors. Okay. Any questions of Mr. Carballo? No, I'm good. Uh, we actually did have someone who piped up early who wanted to testify in support. So, Mr. Carballo, it, um, I think it was Deborah O'Neill. Is there anybody else you have here in support? I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure who who signed on. But, but All right, I'll unmute Ms. O'Neill. Someone then. sign on. Certainly, let them speak. Oh, Ms. O'Neill. Yes, I'm here. Um, I hadn't planned to speak on this part, but um, I've lived in the neighborhood for 30 years, and um, I know uh, I have, I'm very familiar with the history of that property. Um, because of a parking petition that we ran in 2015 and 2016, I know for sure that there were at least two apartments that had residents in them. Um, the bottom uh, portion of the property was inhabited by the owner of the bar around the corner that has become part of this other development. And um, he left it sometime after that. I think he's in a nursing home. And there was an upstairs tenant as well. So, um, you know, as recently as 2017, we've had at least two tenants in that property. Um, so I just, we wanted to speak. Um, I, I sent a letter with a number of neighbors who signed as well. We wanted to speak in support of this. Uh, we quite often, uh, most often come in in opposition to anything that waives parking requirements because parking is very, very tight in the neighborhood. But in this instance, we think it's wise to support the developer um, asking for this experience. Um, he's only seeking to add one additional unit to what we're used to seeing inhabited. We're very, very pleased with his um, decision to kind of support the um, and preserve the historical building. The, the last development would have added a lot of units and would only have preserved the facade of the building 
And so we are, we're very, very pleased with uh, the, the applicant's decision to preserve basically the entire building and improve its, its historical look. Um, but the, the other issue is this has become quite a problem for the neighborhood. We have had squatters moving into that property. We have had a fire, at least one fire that we know of and a lot of drug use. And the building it has frankly become a safety concern We've had an absentee owner for a while now, and um, there was no maintenance being done, nothing really being done to secure the property. And it was in serious uh, risk of demolition by neglect. So we're really, really pleased with this um, proposal. We think it's very respectful of the neighborhood, and we ask that you approve the request. And thanks for letting me speak. Thank you, ma'am. That's it. That's it. Great. Okay. Uh, and then I'll conclude the matter. Mr. Caballo, thank you for your presentation. And we'll take this matter up. Deliberations. Thank you. All right. And that brings us uh, one second. Okay. That takes us back to case number 2021 216. Uh, 16 through 22 East Fayette Street, uh, Caroline Hecker, uh, Esquire is the appellant. And this matter seeks to convert the adjacent properties at 16 through 18 East Fayette Street and 20 through 22 East Fayette Street to a 96 bed residential care facility, including accessory medical offices on the first floor. And I'll hear any reports from planning and staff. Thank you. Planning department has reviewed this application, noted that, uh, Properties covered by this application are located in the Central Business District Urban Renewal Plan area, and therefore any exterior changes to the buildings are going to be subject to design review by the Planning Department. The Department also notes that the property known as 2022 East Bad Street was also once known as the Hotel Junker, and it was combined with 16 and 18 East Bad Street sometime in the mid 20th century, and the combination of the two was referred to as the Marling Hotel. Uh, however, the department notes that apparently the lots have never been consolidated under the combined buildings. The department is concerned about the traffic question because Fayette Street is a westbound one-way street with heavy traffic volume and therefore all loading and all trash and garbage removal must be scheduled to minimize interference with downtown traffic flow, which includes many public bus service routes that use this block of Fayette Street. And therefore, the department encourages the applicant to work with the Department of Transportation to determine what hours for loading zones would be appropriate for this proposed use. The department recommends approval of the application subject to the condition that all exterior alterations and signage placed on these buildings are completed and maintained in accordance with plans to be approved by the Department of Planning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rock. I uh, just checked my emails, um, Jeffrey Washington, who is representing uh, local communities on his way back to his office, says he should be there by 315. Um, but I know we have Miss Hecker here. Um, let me see if I can. I, I mean, I, I could use a little, I could use a little break. Would you um, guys mind if we take a break to, um, to 315? This is our last matter, right? Correct. Um, no, no, let's, if, if if he can't be available till then, I certainly would want him present to uh, hear uh, Ms. Hecker. Right. Uh, so, um, so Katie, Katie yeah. do you have a report on this? I do. So I'll go ahead and give my report, and then um, we. You can... sure you don't want him to to hear that too? I understand that we're trying to expedite, but I mean, let me see. So I'll, see if, I'll see if I can get him the phone number, so maybe he can. Or, you know, listen in um, while we go, and then he can transition when he gets into the office. To it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any difference to me. I just wondered if you guys if you had a report. And I still do need a couple minutes. Yeah, okay. so let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and break, and then we'll resume at three fifteen. Okay, perfect. Three fifteen. All right, sounds good, everybody. Thanks, guys. All right, looks like uh, Mr. Washington is now in the attendees. Great. 
So, and I believe it's Mr. Williams who is here on behalf of the applicant. So I'm gonna go ahead and make him a panelist now. All right, um, so I think we left off with my report, correct? Yes. Again, this is 2021-216, uh, property address 1622 East Fayette Street. The project is proposed as conditional use required to convert an existing seven-story hotel slash office building to use as a residential care facility. The original application was up to 90, with 96 beds and associated improvements in a C5. Uh, the application requires conditional use for residential care facility of 17 or more residents. We've got, um, let's see, a signed MOU between the appellants and Regional Management Inc. regarding the operation of the residential care facility. The research here in 2009, the BMZA approved the use of the second through seventh floors of this particular structure as a hotel. And I believe the MOU was um, included in your packet. Okay. That's what we have. So essentially conditional use for a residential care facility for 17 or more residents. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. Good afternoon. And welcome. Uh, go ahead and uh, tell us about the project, sir. Sure. I guess that balance said too, if we could elevate, I know Councilman Costello is on and um, I guess Mr. Washington, if he's not already a panelist. And then from our side, um, Stefan Popescu, the property owner and then David Thompson are also here. All right, so I'm just gonna throw everybody in as a panelist and that way um, <laughs> when we're ready, everyone can can unmute themselves in order. Thank well, you, I guess, well, the ball? Uh, yeah, please. And then I guess out of respect for Councilman Costello's time, I can let him uh, speak first or go ahead and share his thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Katie, thank you, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, always a pleasure to be with you. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak on this matter, 16 to 22 East Fayette Street. Uh, in short, I wanted to take a moment to uh, thank Mr. Williams and his client. Um, also to uh, thank Mr. Washington. Uh, this group uh, worked very diligently over uh, about a two month period. We had about six or seven different meetings. Uh, to work through specifics of an MOU that's going to be presented to the, to the board today for its consideration. Uh, and this MOU addresses um, a number of concerns that were initially raised um, with respect to the impact of the operations of this uh, proposed use at this site. Uh, and I do believe that we have adequately um, addressed each and every one of those uh, concerns that were raised. Uh, very uh, pleased uh, to say that we have an agreement in principle. And again, uh, hope that the board um, views this favorably. And again, want to thank uh, Mr. Williams and his client, as well as uh, Mr. Washington and several other uh, critical downtown stakeholders uh, for their input throughout this process. Uh, with that, happy to answer any questions or defer to uh, the next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate it. Uh, we could uh, go ahead and, uh, Mr. Williams, I, I guess it's uh, your your call. So where you want to go next? Sure. Yeah, let us go ahead. And I'm not sure, Ms. Byrne, if there are any um, other, I guess, panel attendees or people in opposition. I, I might, so I can judge how thorough to be here uh, in respecting the board's time. So I, I haven't. No one else has put anything in the chat uh, regarding. Um, any opposition? I don't see any additional hands raised. Becky, if you could help monitor that as well. We do have several call. We have three call-in users, but um, yeah, yeah. There's, well, go, there's only a handful of people that. left. Yeah, I'll go through things and then um, if the board has questions, um, obviously answer them. And if there are obviously anyone the community has questions or concerns, I'll address them. But, but I think principally for the board's consideration, the MOU that we submitted to the board staff and that might be part of your file. I think it would address most concerns that would be raised and that we will be um, basically operating entirely within the building envelope. There'd be no external impact. The residents of this proposed facility would uh, never leave out the front door uh, 
unescorted um, during a smoking break or a fresh air break for this um, facility. They'd be in the rear alley only, and that's only with supervision. <clears throat> um, so we think that's that basically resolves most questions. And then the question with the um, or the planning staff comment about traffic concerns. Um, as part of the MOU, we've agreed or the applicant has agreed to work and use commercially reasonable efforts to ensure that any loading that occurs um, you know, won't be disruptive and would not block the loading zone. And we just note that the prior hotel use of the property kind of inherently has a bigger impact on the street front as people and uh, guests in a uh, hotel uh, uh, stay uh, stayers would be Chopping off stuff all times a day. Um, so I'll go through this really briefly. Um, the subject property is at 1618 and 2022 East Lee Street. <clears throat> As uh, I think Mr. French noted, there's history of the hotel use here. We've agreed voluntarily as part of the MOU to reduce our request from the initial 96 uh, residents of this residential care facility down to 48 residents. <clears throat> And we will be providing residential treatment for a substance use disorder, and we anticipate creating about 20 jobs here. Um, as Councilman Costello noted, and I really want to recognize his efforts here to convene five or six meetings with some uh, really uh, uh, diametrically opposed forces here, and he took a lot of his time out, including the Thanksgiving Eve, to mediate disputes and get us to where we are today. <clears throat> So we entered the end of the MOU to, to memorialize the, that agreement. There's also a lot of support I provided to the staff um, this morning um, that are in the file. Um, here's the property storefront here on Fayette Street. <clears throat> um, let's let us support the board's file. Here's the MOU. Um, the highlight points are um, also we will not there will not be an outpatient kind of quote unquote methadone treatment facility here. This would only be an inpatient. Residential care facility. Um, we note under the zoning code, because this is a C5 commercial district, we could do a healthcare clinic use by right. But again, we voluntarily agreed not to uh, operate any outpatient uh, treatment here. This will only be an inpatient facility here. There would not be any walk ins of residents or patients uh, getting treatment here. Um, how this would be proposed to work is the operator, um, David's Loft. Um, represented here by David Thompson Jr. Um, people who would be you know, seeking inpatient treatment would go to the headquarters in Charles Village of, of David's Loft, and they and if they meet the criteria for inpatient treatment, they would then be I guess, further screened and I guess processed and then transported down to this site on Fayette Street for their stay of 30 to 60 days for treatment. <clears throat> um, as part of the MOU, we've also noted that the residents would not be permitted to leave the facility aside from medical appointments with, for which they'd be transported by facility staff. Um, I noted before that all activities would occur in the building envelope and then for smoking or fresh air breaks, they'd be only in the rear alley. <clears throat> and we agreed to use commercially reasonable efforts to avoid blocking traffic. Um, while making deliveries to the property. Um, I just highlighted here more provisions of the MOU um, that would be worth noting. Uh, uh, we will only be providing kind of the lower level of residential treatment. That's on the 3.3 ASAM scale here. Any higher level treatment that's needed by potential uh, resident slash patients would be referred elsewhere. So like people needing what are called detox. Um, help they would go to a facility that can handle that type of care. <clears throat> uh, we would also the operator will retain accreditation status and will be entering into a trash removal plan to ensure there'll be two times a week pickup and there'll be a one for 15 staff resident ratio. Um, the properties in the are subject to the uh, central business urban renewal plan. So any exterior changes would have to be kind of reviewed and vetted by uh, planning anyway. But if we do anything like with bars in the windows, they would have to be on in the inside of the property <clears throat> to respect the historic facade. Um, this is obviously stuff that the board can take notice of. Addiction problem in Baltimore is unfortunately getting worse, and there's been more deaths 
from overdose in at least 2020 than there were from COVID-19 in the city. So this is part of the efforts to um, uh, break the cycle and the city's um, health department plan is predicated on uh, increasing access to on-demand evidence-based treatment. Uh, have more information here's the property here um, on street view. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the arrow on the left side is showing the property. The first uh, middle photo is showing the westward view. The courthouse is on the right side. There's a Walgreens on the left side of the, of the screen, and then the arrow is pointing to our site. And then the bottom picture is showing the opposite direction, looking east on Bayad Street. There's the pot belly in the corner of the street, and then the new Candlewood Suites Hotel on the East Bay Street as well. Um, as I think that as Ms. Byrne mentioned, the property had a history of being um, approved in 2009 from the BMCA, where it's approved for use as a hotel, but not consolidated. <clears throat> Here's the two properties at issue here. And the order read that the hotel would operate as one cohesive project, but they wouldn't have to consolidate. So basically we're keeping the same building footprint and perhaps using or moving some of the tenant out, but using that as downstairs from the business office space. But the residents would be in the upper floors of what were last recently a hotel. <clears throat> um, I just already covered the proposed operation of the facility. Um, the specific request for the board is conditional use approval to allow the operation of a 48 bed residential care facility. I've added here, I guess, being for the benefit of the newer board members, the legal standard for conditional use approval from Schultz v. Pritz is, I mean, most significantly, that the use would be conducted without real detriment to the neighborhood and will not actually adversely affect the public interest. Um, then you have to approve it. And so here, without any operation going on outside the building envelope, there really would be uh, no impact. To the community, Mr. Thompson has another facility in um, the city that is a smaller residential facility, but no one would know it's there. It's on Eager Street in Mount Vernon and has no complaints because it just looks like a normal storefront and people walk by and there's no issues. <clears throat> um, I guess part of the PDF uh, slides I've provided to the board staff already, I have the legal standards the board to consider. I'll just walk through the highlights here. Um, the nature of the proposed site, including its size and shape and arrangement of structures. Um, this is formerly a hotel, so it makes sense to use this as a type of facility that would provide short slash medium term stays. Um, there's a bus lane loading area here. And I think that's part of what Mr. French was getting at as far as being cognizant of um, operations here. But I mean, we've agreed to use reasonable efforts to and shore loading of uh, uh, supplies, materials, and uh, uh, I guess equipment from vendors will not be disruptive. And we think there'd be a lot less of a uh, kind of disruption to the downtown uh, traffic than the hotel use was prior to this. Um, there's not many places of quote unquote public gathering downtown. The courthouse, which is in the distance area, in the photo, but ideally, uh, this you know, at the, by providing more substance abuse treatment options, it will reduce the burden on the criminal justice system for what it's worth. Um, there's no other exterior changes proposed, so there will be no impact light and air or utilities. Um, <clears throat> uh, we know as part of the city's comprehensive master plan, the uh, key objective, and that's funny, it goes back to 2006, but even back then. It was always the plan to increase substance abuse treatment citywide and noting that increasing treatment would save lives, reduce crime, rebuild families and neighborhoods. <clears throat> and so this is aligned with that. And we just note that you know uh, this is in line with the kind of the public welfare, public health provision of the zoning code, that this sort of use is what's necessary to help downtown by agreeing to the provisions in the MOU that we won't have any external impact. Um, the board can feel comfortable approving the use. Um, with that, this is 
Okay, we have the operator and the building owner available. If there's any questions, uh, I'll stop sharing. If there's any questions, otherwise we'll submit. Okay. Not good. Uh, yeah, I have no questions unless there's anything else from the board. Uh, we can uh, move on. Um, we'll be hearing from uh, it. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Williams, on behalf of you, you said you have the operator and, and someone else. Unless they wish to be heard, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, move on to, I guess, Mr. Washington at this point. That's fair. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Washington. Good afternoon, Mr. Fields. Good seeing you again. Yes, good seeing you. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, I did want to, uh, at the first, um, uh, out, I guess at the outset, acknowledge uh, the and thank uh, the councilman for his efforts in uh, bringing the parties together here. There were um, uh, concerns expressed by one of uh, uh, a number, I should say, and by a number of various different stakeholders. Um, uh, and it was good that we were able to all sit down with the applicant, the proposed tenant, um, uh, and diligently work through those. So I did want to uh, acknowledge and thank him for his efforts. Um, <clears throat> uh, and also similarly wanted to thank uh, the applicant and the proposed tenant for their work engaging with shareholders, uh, uh, well, stakeholders as well. Um, uh, I do want to acknowledge that um, uh, my client or the representative of my, of my client is one of the uh, participants on uh, uh, on the phone. Uh, Peter Gross uh, is a representative of regional management and regional has its corporate offices directly across the street from this location. Um, my client's concern from the very beginning really has focused upon uh, a concern over uh, whether or not appropriate resources were being provided or were planned to be provided for uh, uh, potential residents of this facility. Uh, my client didn't have any uh, sensitivities around nimbyism or anything like that. Um, uh, uh, their concern really from the beginning um, revolved around uh, whether or not there were appropriate remedies being, uh, well, resources rather, being provided for um, uh, patients at this facility to ensure a successful treatment. And um, uh, they were taken aback by the size of the proposed use and were concerned that with so many proposed uh, residents that uh, uh, that residents were not going to be able to um, uh, be uh, properly managed with their care uh, and that um, uh, successful treatment would not be uh, provided um, uh, and that the motivation really was more around um, uh, the potential for profit as opposed to ensuring um, proper uh, uh, treatment of patients. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, my client's concerns were um, uh, greatly uh, alleviated in, in their discussions with the proposed tenant, um, hearing about his background and his uh, proposed management for um, uh, uh, patients at this facility. Um, uh, the, obviously, if patients were not being adequately cared for, there, there was the increased potential for um, uh, uh, some rather significant and deleterious street level impacts, which would negatively impact, uh, impact my client's business. There's a growing uh, concentration of these proposed uh, uh, uses around them, uh, and a number of them are not properly managed, and they do suffer the negative impacts from that. Um, so when we went into negotiations with the applicant and uh, his proposed tenant, um, we were um, uh, concerned around those impacts uh, and remain concerned. However, we do feel that there is an appropriate agreement in place to ensure that uh, any potential uh, impacts about which we're concerned um, will be mitigated and uh, have the ability to be properly addressed and minimized. Um, 
uh, and therefore my client is um, uh, much more comfortable with this proposed use in its scaled back fashion than it had been um, and uh, would ask that any um, uh, approval from this board be conditioned upon, well, rather I should say incorporate as a condition of that approval, the MOU, uh, uh, which the parties have reached in this case. Okay. Well, very well. And to the extent, uh, <clears throat> come to that conclusion, it's appropriate to move forward with this and grant the appeal. That would be, as you know, Mr. Washington, something that we have done in the past to incorporate MOUs and, uh, uh, given the party's uh, negotiated agreement to those terms, uh, that would be uh, best for all parties. So uh, certainly uh, that would be a part of uh, a grant of, uh, of this request. So appreciate that background and uh, you know, sensitive to those issues that you raised. Thank you. And uh, who, who else uh, uh, will we be hearing from at this point? Uh, is there, your client. Is there anyone from your client who wishes to speak, Mr. Washington? Uh, no, uh, he's fine. Just um, uh, listening in. Very well. At this point. Thank you. Uh, Katie, do you All see right. anyone else? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> the dreaded mute button. Um, it doesn't seem that we have anyone in the chat that wishes to speak. I don't see any hand raised, but what I will do is go through. We have three call in users. So anybody, sure. if you are here, uh, wishing to speak on 2021-216-16-22 East Fayette Street. And when you hear two beeps, please speak up. So we have three users. I'll go through them now. First caller. Okay, going to the second caller. And now the last caller. Okay, so that's it. Um, no one else in the chat, no one else raising their hand wishing to speak. Okay, um, very well. Uh, Mr. Williams, uh, is there any uh, parting comments you wish to uh, to add before we close off this matter? Nothing further in light of the board's you know, going on multiple hours of hearing, so we'll submit them on what's been well. discussed already. All right, we appreciate that. Appreciate your presentation. Uh, and that will uh, conclude matter number 2021-216. And we will uh, <clears throat> conclude the docket uh, portion of the day and proceed to the deliberation portion.